Uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, who has been working uh, on open source and different technology in uh, an organization called Accenture since 2001. Uh, Sven Lober is the Managing Director of the Emerging Technology Group at Accenture. Uh, he works with Accenture clients to help them leverage uh, open source in many ways to create businesses, to make their business more efficient. Please welcome to the stage, Sven Lober. So, yeah, as, as Jim mentioned, Sven Lober, part of Accenture's emerging technology practice. I lead an open source within Accenture, so I work with our clients on helping to define their next generation uh, application architectures, and really that is open source by default. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about three different things. A little bit about Accenture's journey uh, to open source that we've taken over the last couple decades, as well as then how we then work with our clients, as far as whether it be how to incrementally modernize some of their legacy systems, hopefully to leverage a lot of open source technologies, or how do they enable new business capabilities. Uh, that they're looking to bring to market. And then they'll talk a little bit about some of the open source initiatives that we're working with partners and clients uh, as part of those efforts to modernize or to bring new capabilities. So first, just uh, briefly on Accenture's open source journey. So uh, back about a decade or so, we incorporated uh, InnerSource. We've got about 3,000 different projects going on. Of course, Accenture's pretty large. We're about, uh, when I first started, we were about 50,000. Uh, we're about 440,000, so obviously a lot of growth over the last uh, uh, many years. So with those, you know, we want to incorporate InnerSource. So that obviously, you know, was a journey for us, uh, thinking about the large system integration work that we did for years. I still do, but more and more of that custom development became open source, right, by default. So that was a big effort of ours as far as adopting InnerSource about, about uh, seven or eight years ago. We uh, looked at our open source policy that we defined and rewrote it really to encourage the use of, not just the use, but the contribution. So as many more millennials were joining Accenture, uh, it was important that we allowed them and really kind of encouraged, right, and uh, incented them to, to not just use open source, but be contributors to the various communities out there which I'll talk a little bit about. Or also, you know, our, our open source initiatives. So certainly we started with InnerSource, uh, then we moved to, okay, how can we then either open source or start to work with the various open source communities and foundations. Uh, and so one of our efforts really right now is how can we start to measure a lot of those things. So we're working with Chaos and GitHub and others as far as how can we quantify that. Uh, and then finally, you know, as far as what we're doing now, is uh, really looking at kind of the diverse kind of ways we contribute. So certainly code is one way that we contribute, but given kind of Accenture's business, our focus certainly kind of has business, business expertise, uh, our role is, is different as far as depending on the various communities that we play. Some of it's around doing various testing, applying different industry use cases that we're familiar with as far as based on our various verticals. Uh, some of it's writing documentation. So I think it's an important aspect just to think about it as a whole which is, you know, so many of you are, are looking or are contributing to open source projects or colleagues are asking, okay, how can I contribute? Uh, and it's not just about, you know, contributing code, that's certainly important, uh, but also there's a lot more ways to contribute, uh, whether it be getting involved in meetups or whether it be, you know, writing the documentation or other various forms. Uh, so here's just briefly just to give you a sense of, of some of the open source uh, foundations and communities that Accenture is a part of. So certainly the Linux Foundation is a, is a large asset. So uh, back at I had Summit a, a couple years ago, we were uh, announced that we were going to become a, a gold member uh, of the Linux Foundation. So we're the first system integrator to do that. Uh, so that was a big moment. And since then, we've joined uh, six. So most recently, the CNCF and the uh, JS Foundation, which really reflects kind of the, the evolution uh, of extension, really kind of where development is going, sort of custom development, uh, moving from what we had about 40 or 50 Java uh, developers now to a lot more JavaScript TypeScript uh, that reflects kind of that, as well as the broader cloud data uh, shift. So that's a little about Accenture's journey, and certainly we'd love to talk with any of you about kind of open source and how you take that, whether it be your governance and others. But now I'm going to talk a little bit more about okay, how do we work with clients. So many clients, you know, are not born in the cloud, web scale companies. You know, many of them have 30 or 40 years of legacy IT, right? Uh, they have, you know, systems that are critical to their operations, whether it be a core banking system, whether it be a claim system, whether it be reservations, these are the, the heart and soul uh, of what makes them run day to day. 
Uh, but right, all these great technologies that we were talking about yesterday with Kubernetes and Kubelin, all these things that are going on as far as this IS becomes really a service and everything else, right, becomes open source. They're left with, okay, but what about all the stuff that we already have? So that's a lot of what I spend talking with clients as well, which is, okay, hey, great, we'll help you define what your next generation application architectures look like, but we recognize that you have a whole bunch of other stuff today that you know, needs to get modernized in some shape or form at the same time the business is not going to stop. Right, so you know, some of the, the challenges they have, right, these, these clients uh, as far as work yourself, right, that aren't going in the cloud, they have this legacy. Uh, right, first, it's, you know, the, the challenge of, okay, the, the various customer expectations are changing, right? So uh, the, the degree of personalization, right, that a consumer expects, right, working with a various enterprise. So uh, me, for example, so, uh, you know, landed in Beijing, Beijing for the first time, uh, on, uh, on Saturday, what did I first do? I, I uh, first do, uh, as far as when I uh, got off the plane and, and uh, got my bag, was, you know, pull a DD, right, as far as it fired up a, a, an app. Never had, uh, you know, taken a, a taxi or cab here, but my first explanation was, okay, I expect, uh, you know, DD didn't know who I am, I speak English, I'm looking for a certain type of car, where to take me, right, and that's just by default, right? So. Uh, that's the expectation of many clients, right, as far as the customers that uh, our clients have. Uh, the other aspect, right, as far as uh, the technology innovation is happening, certainly open source, look at that, the amount of change that's occurring, right, blockchain, IoT, serverless, uh, AI, right, all these things are happening faster and faster, uh, right, and many uh, right, uh, of the businesses want to take and build capabilities around these, but, but what do they do, right? Also, right, you have the challenge of, as far as all these emerging, as far as uh, uh, new market uh, entrants, right? So in the case of uh, the Marriott's, right, of the world, or other large hotelers, Airbnb, right, coming and now being kind of the larger, you know, largest kind of uh, hotel space, right, in the world, larger than many of the largest uh, hotelers combined, right, displacing them, okay, now what do they have to do? Right, uh, as well as then the, uh, you know, the blurring of industry boundaries, right? So you now have certainly the Alibabas, the Amazons, right? Who started out as, as, okay, let's do online retailing, but now it's all about, okay, what else can I do? Can I become a bank? Can I become uh, someone that uh, can be a distributor of medicine, right? All these other things, right, that are challenging. Uh, and then the cross pressure, right? So the reality is many CIOs today, right, don't have the, the luxury of getting more and more budget, right? In fact, sometimes it's, you know, it's decreasing, right? Their business as usual is expected to decrease. Uh, at the same time, they're looking to do, you know, more with less. So that's kind of the, the situation they're in. And combined with that, this challenge, okay, I want to be able to innovate more and more, is where many of them sit, we call it the, the discontinuity curve, or IT discontinuity curve, which is, okay, Many of these, you know, kind of enterprises started out with, you know, good core systems, right? Uh, and then those core systems became, you know, modified, you know, over years, sometimes decades, right? Uh, but what happened throughout that journey, right, was, okay, new change, okay, add something to it, customize it, whether it be a package or something custom. Uh, and so as that evolution curve happened, right, they were able to introduce new capabilities very easily. But there came to a point where one dollar investment that used to receive uh, you know, ten dollars worth of return on investment, it now took two dollars to get that same return. Then it's three, then it's four, then it's five. Right before now, you know, at the bottom is essentially you know, where it's basically become you know, a, a point where business cases are no longer able to be done, right? Because it takes as much, if not more, to make changes, right? So the only thing you do is do the regulatory and other kind of things that are have to do, uh, have to do type things, right? At that point, essentially, you know, the IT organization becomes bankrupt in the sense that they can no longer do any changes, right, besides those regulatory ones. So this is a place where a lot of our, our clients find themselves, right, uh, in, in struggle. So how can they do this, right? They no longer have these hundreds of millions of dollar programs anymore. Uh, the business wants to build these minimal viable products, get out, change quickly, and, you know, bring new things to market. Uh, but at the same time, they're saddled with this legacy IT, right? These monolithic systems in some cases that are very difficult to make changes to, right? So what they need to do, right, ultimately, you know, is what we talk as far as looking at their systems is how can they unlock that data? A lot of times, whether these systems aren't as very agile, they may be doing kind of, you know, as far as millions, billions, trillions of transactions in some cases, 
Uh, they're great. Simple make changes to them, but they have data locked inside them, right? That are very available to other uh, aspects as far as uh, of what was being built to get access to those. They they would be very uh, it would be very attractive, right? So a lot of it is how can we unlock the data in these various monolithic systems, right? How can we then start to build services, right, that provide those those capabilities that we want to be able to build on the edge, right? Those systems of differentiation. We still want to have those core systems, and those core systems are going to evolve ideally. Uh, whether it be okay, let's either be able to modernize them to either uh, get them back to the point where they are kind of doing their core function and not some of those other things that probably built the better as microservices and other things that are very nimble and be able to make those small incremental changes, right? Uh, or they may move to SaaS, right? They say, hey, we get to a point where this is something that when we built it 20 years ago, this is really differentiating. But the reality is now this is 95% of what other businesses in our industries use as well. Okay, that makes far more sense to do. Let's go buy a SaaS for that. Let's focus on what we're going to do custom as a system of differentiation. But how can I make that incremental journey? How can I unlock that data? How can I start to build services that I can make those kind of small incremental changes to incorporate new business capability? Maybe slowly evolve some of that legacy system to more of a microservice cloud native architecture, uh, but at the same time be able to run some of it, or maybe even replace those legacy systems over time. So this is a little bit what the journey starts to look like. So you have that core system, right, that's been kind of built, it's kind of expanded. Uh, many, right, it's about kind of how can we unlock that data, so it's an introduction of a data lake, they may start to create things or add things uh, around automation, like RPA, robotic process automation, right, they also start to take a little bit of a journey to, to cloud, right, whether it be private or public, just cloud in general, uh, they start to do that journey, right, so uh, that's the first step, incorporating the data lake, start to build a bit of a services layer, uh, but then the, the next step really be how can we, and this is where it gets to be uh, reactive and an event-driven architecture, which is really where we see kind of the next generation applications going, right? So it's really how can we now take as kind of that next step, how can we make these systems more event-driven? Uh, and an event-driven meaning, okay, that we can have things happen asynchronously, everything can kind of interact with each other, we don't have to worry about all those interdependencies. Uh, that was really the problem with some of those monolithic systems that have all these interdependencies that are difficult to make changes. So that's, that's where we want to get to. We want to get to more of a data event-based approach that we can have those services that are in, in completely independent and we're still being able to access the data, which is great. But how do we get there? What are some of the building blocks that look, uh, to get there? So one of those is to use a, a change data capture approach. The idea is, okay, all these monolithic systems, how many layers they have within them, uh, and the different kind of integration points. The reality is that all the data ultimately trickles down to some data source, right? The idea of being kind of in a, in a true kind of uh, system of record, it gets persistent, right, to this somewhere, right? Whether it be a mainframe, whether it be a distributed system, it gets persistent, right? And if you can capture those changes, right, and do a change data capture approach called uh, CDP, is you replicate that. Now you can start to get that agility. You can unlock that data, okay? If you can unlock that data, okay, how can we now make that more event-based? So using event streaming technology, whether it be Kafka or other uh, data streams, right? Putting that and kind of making that now be able to push onto those event hubs of, of, of reachback, right? And if we have then microservices that we can build on top of those, right? Uh, but the trick being, okay, it's, everyone when you talk about microservices, they're like, yeah, reactive architecture, we really like to do that. But you know, working with events is kind of hard. It's the same challenge on the UI. Hey, it'd be great to be able to have asynchronous events flow through uh, the system, okay? But, okay, that's very difficult to do. So we're gonna continue to do kind of a similar, kind of more service-oriented architecture uh, that you know, still is more about the layers and kind of have various levels of integration and various kind of consumers of those services have to know who they're calling. Uh, and really the shift is, okay, how can we get those to be, how can we make it easier uh, to be event driven, to consume events, to push events. Uh, and so that was really the challenge that we kind of solved with something we call the Reactive Interactive Gateway. So the Reactive Interactive Gateway basically makes it very easy to consume events through a whole series of different protocols, whether it be as far as over HTTP, whether it be over WebSockets or others. And that's what it enables uh, basically kind of this picture, which is the idea of, okay, if we can have legacy systems that we can start doing a change data capture approach to push those events, have something that then puts those events onto an event hub stream. Okay, great, okay, now that we have that, we can have microservices that we're building new capabilities around. 
or taking legacy systems, right? That we're going to say, hey, this functionality here, here, and here, we're going to rewrite that using domain-driven design, right? We're going to now define this as a domain and a bit and, and, a, and a microservice. We're going to plug it into the event hub, right? And we're going to start to consume that. And we're going to eventually strangle off you know, that monolithic system, or at least a good portion of it. And that's really kind of depending on what really is a core piece of functionality, what's really, you know, kind of some of that band-aid or that kind of, uh, you know, that scar, right, that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place, but it became technical debt over time. That if we had done it the right way, right, in new technologies, we could have seen this in the future, we would have built those microservices two years back. So now those are microservices, right, we can now have uh, the UIs, right? But the UIs now, like, the challenge there is, okay, we want them to be able to just consume events, right? Uh, we don't have to impose the complexity of okay, having single page apps has to, to be able to consume these events. So that's just where Rig comes in. It can work with API management products out there as well, but it basically makes that very easy to do and can do it at a very large scale. Uh, and then also you have these various notification services and other common services. Okay. And this is, uh, normally I do a, a demo, but not today as far as uh, didn't have time, but certainly would love to show it to you. But basically now that you have these events flowing through the system, Right, everything is now an event, whether it be a keystroke that's happening on a single page app, whether it be something that's happening when you push the legacy system that's now being pushed into the event hub, whether it's a microservice, everything's talking into events. Right? And so now you can plug in and do kind of machine learning and other things, like things that are going across the, the event hub, right? Those various streams, right? You want to do kind of real-time uh, fraud analytics, okay, if you want to do kind of next best action, whether you want to do all these various notifications, right? And the beauty of it is, okay, we didn't nothing's interdependent, right? And anything can plug into the event hub and start to consume events or emit events, right? Everyone can then, you know, benefit from, from the event hub. So that's where the future is. That's a little bit of what we're taking it. A rig again, uh, the reactive interaction gateway, based on a lecture and a number of technologies. Uh, this actually, uh, this week, uh, just became a project in CNCF as far as an incubator project. So certainly go check it out uh, as far as it's open source. So. It's something that we want to work certainly, you know, with the broad, broader cloud native computing foundation and the broader kind of open source communities on. Uh, we think it's quite powerful, right? So, like I said, it can consume, you know, HTTP, Kafka, Kinesis. We're working with all the various other cloud providers, right, to say, hey, what other things that we should be able to provide? And working with it to, to broaden it as a managed service uh, around those different uh, cloud providers. So certainly go check it out. Certainly looking forward to. Uh, talk with you as far as for the remainder of the day and certainly kind of in the broader landscape uh, as far as the marketplace uh, in the future. Thank you.